Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Now, this week's show helped me reach another milestone in re-entry into the, the before time. Uh, my guest suggested that he come out to my house for the podcast session rather than my trekking into NYC to, to record with him. Um, and that meant doing some long delayed house cleaning on, on Saturday morning. And, and I finally got to break out the stylish folding table and chairs I bought a few months ago for at home pod sessions, which are Incredibly rare even before the pandemic, but I had some spare money. Okay, I'll just put it that way. And I, I wanted to get something nice. And so I have these these chairs and a little table and it's perfect for the podcast. And anyway, this also meant that someone was going to be entering our house for the first time since Thanksgiving of 2019 for a purpose other than fixing our freezer or delivering a new dryer. Um Seriously, nobody has come into our house for anything besides those two purposes in, sheesh, well, we're getting on nearly two years. And it's weird to think about gaps that long in in day-to-day -day activities, but but that's life, or lack thereof. In fact, on the, the drive home from the train station after I picked him up, I, I mentioned this to him, and he, well, I also asked, when was the last time you were in a car? Because he's in the city and, well, anyway, he said, I was in a cab once last year, but I can't remember when. Anyway, um, I'm glad we did the show at home, uh, especially because it prompted me to rearrange and or toss out some of the junk and clutter that have been piling up. I say piling up in my library, but what I really mean is piling up in my mind. Um, and I've got a couple of remote sessions planned for this weekend with guests in the UK and Singapore, but I really am trying to get back to some semblance of normal where I, I sit down with someone in person and, and just do this. But um, anyway, let's get to the show and see how it worked out this time. Uh, my aforementioned in-house guest is Ron Hogan, uh, who is the author of the new book, Our Endless and Proper Work, Starting and Sticking to Your Writing Practice. It's from Belt Publishing. Ron was on the show, which we also recorded here at home, in 2015. And in addition to the, the new book, Ron's life is, has changed in some interesting ways. We did a COVID check-in uh, spring of 2020, but that was you know, an extraordinary period. So anyone's uh, uh, take on how their life was going should be you know, mitigated with that in mind. But... But now, with our endless and proper work, Ron is, well, the book itself is an adaptation of Ron's ongoing Substack email, Destroy Your Safe and Happy Lives, which you really ought to subscribe to. And there'll be a link to that in the show notes. The book and that email explore aspects of the writing life, not in a how to write a bestseller way, but, but in terms of actually doing the work of writing and and how the process can be more important than the product, which is a phrase that comes up both in the book and our conversation. And as the subtitle of the book makes clear, Ron focuses on the importance of the practice of writing, the sense that one needs to do this regularly. One needs to figure out a way to carve out time uh, in one's life for writing, even while we may be stuck to a, a greater or lesser extent on the the capitalist hamster wheel. And we get into a lot of this in the conversation, so I don't want to talk too deeply about the contents. But trust me, it's it's a really worthwhile dive into these issues. I mean, it's a good book with both practical advice about writing and publishing, but also a thoughtful examination of, of how writing can reveal us to ourselves and and help us change and maybe change the lives of others. 
And and I know there's a big gap between writing and publishing, and this isn't about why you should just be, you know, giving up on publishing dreams and journaling for yourself. There is a, a practical aspect to it all, like I say, about from somebody who's had a, or has a writing career and works as an editor and writer. Um, so yeah, our endless and proper work. It's got some fun illustrations by the artist M. Roy, by the way, also. So it's, it's not just text. Um, but it's a, oh, it's a really good book in terms of, enabling you to understand what writing can really mean and how to to make it worthwhile again for yourself and for others so check out our endless and proper work and take a peek at ron's email destroy your safe and happy lives there's a free version and a uh, paid subscription version anyway there'll be info for all that in the the show notes now here's ron's bio from the book there is a more extensive one at beatrice.com his website Ron Hogan has been an industry analyst for a media website, a digital marketing director for a publishing house, a freelance book reviewer, and an acquiring editor for a startup book publisher. He is the founder of the literary site Beatrice and creator of a popular newsletter about developing your writing practice, Destroy Your Safe and Happy Lives. And now, the 2021 Virtual Memories Conversation with Ron Hogan. So how did the book come together? I know it's a collection from your, your e-newsletter, but, you know, what was the, the process of first pitching the book and, you know, assembling it? Sure. So, so yes, um, our endless and proper work comes about because I had been doing the Destroy Your Safe and Happy Lives newsletter since 2018. And... It wasn't, you know, it wasn't the case that I set out to write a book. I, you know, was like, okay, let's do this newsletter. And it was, you know, it took several months before me to realize that it's like, oh, yeah, you know, I could string like, you know, some of these together and like figure out like, you know, the holes in the middle and there would be a, a book length object at the end of this. Yeah. What happened is one of the other newsletters that I was reading was Ann Trubex. Uh, she's the publisher of at Belt Publishing, and she had been doing a Substack newsletter about um, the vagaries of the book publishing business, which she turned into a book. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that she had done this, I emailed her and said, "You know that you know this is a really great idea to have this book about you know dealing with the publishing industry. Uh, I happen to have this you know newsletter about." maintaining a writing practice. Although I think at the time it wasn't even necessarily that ov narrowly focused. Yeah. The original focus was more like all the other stuff about the writing life besides the writing. Yeah. Like it was, yeah. it was going to teach you about like, you know, the sort of like emotional and, and, uh, and other costs of being in, in the book publishing world, um, dealing with like, you know, industry professionals intent of the newsletter had been like, Oh, let's talk about the writing life. And it gradually sort of focused into let's deal with, um, you know, maintaining a, a, a steady, consistent writing practice yeah. and what are the emotional and mental and spiritual benefits of doing that. Um, so I go to Anne and I say, Oh, you know, I have this newsletter about, writing practices, which I also think would make a great book. And she said, yes, yes, it would. Uh, and I said, it's called Destroy Your Safe and Happy Lives. And she's like, yeah, that doesn't really sound like a... <laughs> Jumping off the shelf. A, a write, well, I mean, it's, it's a great title, yeah. you know, it, but not necessarily for a creative writing book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that's when I you know, was reading Mary Oliver and I found our endless and proper work uh, and used... Um, use that for a, one of the essays that ends up in the finished book and then was like, you know, that's actually a pretty good title too. Yeah. And then they agreed. And what was it like sort of revisiting the essays and forming them into the, the book, just sort of coming up with the interstitial stuff or were there, I know it's only been a few years that you were doing the email, but 
were there things you look back at and, oh, my God, I can't believe I, I published that in an email. That's definitely not going in the book. Uh, no, no, there wasn't uh, that necessarily. Uh, I think it was pretty much a process of, you know, once we figured out how long we wanted the book to be. Uh, and it's, you know, a medium sized length. It was a matter of pulling together that many essays. And so like going through and picking out like, you know, things that were thematically consistent. Like there are outliers uh, from the first year or two of the newsletter that weren't thematically consistent mm -hmm. that sort of fell by the wayside. Uh, and, there, and then there's like a whole bunch of stuff that was geared specifically towards National Novel Writing Month that um, I didn't really re feel like reworking at the moment. Um, but once I had enough material to cover the length of a book, then it's a matter of like, oh, okay, figuring out how these things fit together. Um, and part of that is not quite so hard because when you're thinking about a topic that intently over a three year period, well, I guess it was only two years at the time that I started pulling it together. Um, you know, you, you are to a certain extent circling the subject. Hmm. So things do fall into place and click together and you realize that it's like, Oh, okay. Yes. I have been talking around the same subject five or six times. <laughs> Uh, in, you know, with different angles. Yeah. Uh, and that those make a good chapter. Uh, and then, yeah, then there's a matter of realizing that it's like, oh, okay, yeah, it's one thing to write about, um, you know, topic A in one week and then a couple months later write about topic B. And then when you try to put them together in a book, you realize that there's a bridge missing. Uh, and you, you sit there and you figure out, well, okay, what is the bridge? And sometimes it's a simple paragraph and sometimes it turns out to be like a whole other, um, you know, thousand words of and that you have to fight the temptation to put into another newsletter. You know, that's, sometimes that's you a... don't fight it necessarily. <laughs> sometimes you're like, Oh, well, here's my topic for this week's newsletter. <laughs> yeah. Talk about the, well, who the book is for and, and the notion of a writing practice and really what goes into building that for oneself. Okay, so the book is for anyone who wants to get serious about a writing practice. And I say writing practice to distinguish that from, you know, wanting to become a published writer, mm -hmm. uh, which is a great goal. But I noticed that a lot of people, for a lot of people, the, the only goal is like, oh, I'm going to become a published writer. And... That sort of like emphasis on the outcome rather than the process, um, it, it kind of, it, you know, um, I'm making a hand gesture yeah, he's here. Got the, you it's in the back of your brain. Yeah, I've got the, yeah, I'm making this hand gesture that, that really doesn't, you know, go someday, over someday on we'll radio. pivot to video. You'll yes. see. <laughs> um, so it was like, you know, sitting there in the back of my head going, hey, there's something here. There's something. Um, but yeah, so. So becoming a published writer is a great goal, but you know this idea that it's like, oh, I'm going to become a best-selling writer, um, or, or yeah. not even like, yeah, you know, maybe your goal, maybe the dream isn't specifically I'm going to become a best-selling writer, um, but it's like, oh, I'm going to like you know be a writer full time and I'm going to live off my writing and it'll be great. And people do that. Very few. Very few. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And it depends on what you call living. Yeah. But go on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, all of which was to say that it's like, you know, first and foremost, I feel like, you know, you're writing because you have something to say uh, and you have something that you're trying to figure out. And I wanted to put my emphasis on that part of the process. And so it's about... Um, finding time to write, um, uh, organizing your life around the goal of writing and through the writing, uncovering what it is that you are trying to say, what you, what the thing is that you have to share with people, uh, and you know, what it is that matters to you really. 
uh, you know, what are the things that, you know, that drive your passion that, that make you want to do things? What are the parts of the book you wish you had read when you were young? Which is a oblique way of asking, what did you have to learn? Yeah. Uh, what was the toughest thing to learn, I guess? Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, one of the toughest things to learn is that sort of like, you know, letting go of the goals. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, realizing that if you want to be famous, for example, there are an infinite number of other ways, better ways to do that than becoming a writer. If you want to make a lot of money, there are plenty of better ways to do that (laughs) than becoming a writer. Um, And to just be able to, to write without those end goals in mind, or at least without them in the forefront of your mind all the time to just learn to, situate yourself in the process and see what happens. Do you think the historical moment of when you were young, that goal-based mentality was not, I don't want to say unrealistic, but, you know, at the time in the 90s, you know, I'm going to be a writer, meant something a lot different, I think, than, you know, in the 2020s or 2010s, the internet era, basically, and the proliferation of of who gets to quote unquote right which is sort of a question <laughs> sort of a question um I'm, I, you know let me cast myself back to the 1990s and and what i was doing there was a heroic idea of being a writer mm-hmm. then yeah. i think one of the reasons that i wanted to write at the time um and it's weird i mean i went through a, a lot of transitional stuff in the nineties. Um, you know, my original, you know, adolescent forward dream was to become a, a writer director. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I went to film school. I have a ma- master's in film studies. Um, but kind of realized that it's like, well, I don't necessarily want to, to do that. Um, and the internet was just sort of starting to take off. So there, you know, it was this idea of you can put your own writing out there more easily than ever before. So that was kind of attractive. But at the same time, there was there was this very specific notion of and it's what steered me towards academia after the specific dream of becoming a, a, a writer director um, started to, to, to diminish. Was this idea of. You know, all I really want to do is sit around and think about stuff and and and, and talk about stuff and write about and gotta be a professor. Yeah. <laughs> and that that seemed like, you know, the ideal sort of goal there. And that um so the you know, then the writing became about like, you know, let's focus on, you know, this very particular kind of academic writing. Um which honestly took a very long time to get out of my system and probably has never fully left, but hopefully um, I've retained only the best bits. Um, and The analytical mind as opposed to the jargon. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the ability to construct an argument um, and to like think things through and to like, you know, go through that analytic process rather than bog it down in a lot of uh, theoretical Jargon, as you say. But, yeah, then... Over the the, the subsequent quarter century... <laughs> Which sounds horrible when you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I've always sort of, like, made a conscious effort that the things I did to make money, to put food on the table were aligned in some way with what I wanted to be doing with my intellectual life or with my spiritual life. Um, I mean, spiritual in a very broad sort of sense, this sort of like, you know, which I want to ask about. 
Yeah, but, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. Um, maybe philosophical for now is a good um, synonym. Um, I prefer cosmological in that Henry Miller esque sense, but okay. you know Miller's yeah. kind of verboten. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but anyway, like that the that the, 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 the day job somehow fed into the inner life mm -hmm. in some capacity, uh, and I was reasonably good at that. Um, sometimes better than others. But the flip side of that is that sometimes, um, you know, the time that you spent during the day coming up with like this stuff that spoke to you in a meaningful way or spoke to me in a meaningful way for somebody else um, left me a little bit drained at the end of the day uh, and that it became easier to sort of, oh, let's, you know, let's read a book or let's let's watch something rather than like, you know, go to my own stuff. Yeah. Uh, I, I do think I've gotten a little bit better over the recent years at carving out time for me and, and, and mm -hmm. my, um, the things that I want to say. Yeah. What's the, we'll say the tips, tricks, and techniques, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when it comes to, to developing the writing practice and, and really making those, making that time for oneself. You know, I know you go into some examples of it in the book, you know, I, I wonder, you know, do, do you still encounter those moments of, well, the, the, the mood has to be right as opposed to screw that. This is when I'm supposed to be writing. I need yeah. to start writing, you know, how you, uh, how do you overcome that? I guess. Some days you do. And some days you don't. Yeah. Um, you know, I think a lot of us thought, for example, at, you know, the beginning of spring 2020, as we, many of us, were sheltering in place. And I, I emphasize many of us because a lot of us weren't. Yeah. Uh, a lot of us had more burden placed upon us than ever before in the spring of 2020. But a lot of people were stuck at home and said to themselves, oh, this is going to be the most productive time of my life ever. Uh, you know, it was almost as if, like, as a culture... A certain, you know, middle slash upper class um, batch of us were like um, Burgess Meredith at the end, <laughs> you know, well, time, enough, time enough. enough at last. Yeah. <laughs> um, Just instead of the glasses, you know, yeah. we, we worry about dying by breathing. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, dying by, by breathing or, you know, you know, being trapped in a uh, despotic regime. Right. Um, so we didn't get the writing done. We didn't get the reading done that we, we thought we were going to do. And, you know, that's OK. You, 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 you do sort of have to, like, tell yourself that, you know, it's OK not to be at 100 percent. Yeah. Um, but, you know, saying that in terms of, you know, how you actually move forward. You know, it's funny, there's a point in the book at which I invoke, um, it's not really a parable per se, because it's only a sentence long or so. Uh, but there's that point in the Gospels where Jesus says, you know, I tell you, with faith the size of a mustard seed, you could move a mountain. Yeah. And it kind of dawned on me as I was writing that version of the newsletter um, that, that that's really about attention and focus. That it's like if you apply yourself, you know, and there's that pseudoscientific notion that we only ever use 10% of our brains. Yeah. And if, you know, what would happen if we used even more? Uh, but it's true. If we use more of our attention and focus, if we, you know, just step back from the routines that we have developed in which society has developed for us. If we step back and put our conscious attention into something else, the more of that attention we put into it, um, the more capacity we develop for being able to accomplish something. And so it is like really a conscious choice very often. Um, I mean, and, and sometimes the choice is made for us in a capitalist economy. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, 
if you want to eat, you need food. If you want food, you need money. If you want money, you have to like, you know, do this work. Um, but what's the old labor slogan? Uh, eight hours for the work, eight hours to sleep, eight hours for the, for me. Uh, and it's, you know, it's what you do in those eight hours for me, um, that really matters in terms of that kind of creative life that, you know, it's very easy to say like, okay, you know, you know, it's a choice between, you know, sitting down for an hour and trying to write or sitting down for an hour and watching this episode of whatever, or, you know, or lately it's been Rockford files reruns <laughs> on, on Peacock, but yeah, we all have our, our wait, our, Rockford files is on Peacock. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. sweet. We've been rolling through season one. <laughs> oh, it's, man. It's, it's, we tried Columbo and it just, it's just too different from, from what we're used to in TV. And it, it just, the structure of, of episodes is too weird and fell into the Rockford files. And it's like, Oh my God, this is just tremendous. So, yeah. but anyway, that's okay. a, a side thing, <laughs> but you know, it, it, it reminds me though, and regular listeners will be bored by this, but I don't have any regular listeners. So a few weeks ago when I was on with, with Will McPhail, a New Yorker cartoonist who has a new graphic novel out, we were talking about, I took up drawing a couple of months ago, never drew in my life. And at 50, I just had this, thing and decided to start drawing those trees out in the, the, the yard over there. And we talked about the sense of when I'm in the, uh, when I'm in a drawing mode or now watercolors, I don't think about anything, but the thing I'm, I'm working on and doing, and there's no generic drug user fee negotiations or the laundry or this out of the other. Nothing gets into my head except the work itself. I, I'm conscious of what I'm working on, but I'm not conscious of any of this other stuff. And I asked him as an artist, and I've asked a few other artists, whether they experience that given that this is a profession for them. Can they afford to fall into something the way I can? And for the most part, they're like, yeah, no, that's totally what we go through. That, you know, when I'm doing this, this is it. From Will's perspective, his take was that's going to trump all of the mindfulness apps and the other ways of trying to, to monetize this stuff. He said true meditation is being in the practice of, of what you're doing. Now, for me, the downside is once I started drawing and all that stuff, I lost any interest I had in writing <laughs> whatsoever. But, you know, I, everything I do with the show, in a sense, is writing. But uh, there's a degree that I'm like, yeah, I'm, I have no interest in working on a, a written piece that I was doing. I'll do my weekly email. But a second issue of my zine is really far off if it's going to involve essays and such. But, yeah, that sense of being in something, in the practice of it, you know, it, it's it's a challenge, I guess, when that thing that you're in the middle of is language itself. Yeah. But so, here's the thing. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, the book goes on. And some would say it goes on and on. Uh, <laughs> it's only 120 pages. It can't go on that long. It's okay. But it, it, it goes on <laughs> and, and really tries to hammer home this notion that writing is about bringing forth what is in you to share with the world. Yeah. Um, finding out who you are, what matters to you, and putting that out there. Writing, of course, is not the only way to do that. Right. So, you know, the podcast is a way to do that. Um, you know, when I had a podcast, when I was talking to memoirists, you know, I wasn't just picking people because I thought like people, you know, other people would listen to it. I mean, that was a hope. But, you know, you, you can't really do that sort of thing chasing after clicks yeah. or hits. And I... I it's an unfortunate nature. I don't think it's just the internet that does this thing. The internet exacerbates it. Certainly, I think we've always had that that drive. But television works on the same model. Yeah, and and before that, it's it's people were chasing audiences, yeah. you know, in in various ways over centuries. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that sense of oh, sorry, go on. Yeah, but uh, you know, if podcasting is your way of sharing your message with the world, so be it. If if you are more visually oriented, whether it's like um, a full-time thing or whether that's something that you're exploring in the moment, so be it. You know, the idea that one creative passion or another is taking time away from 
your writing, if it's what's working for you, if it's yeah. what's drawing things out, then by all means, go for that. Oh, that's my whole thing. At 50 years old, I'm I'm in this whole self-discovery thing through this. So I'm like, wow, I had no idea I had visual imagination or any aptitude with a pencil. I go figure, you know, th those things. Right. You know, you, and you, you invoked know. meditation yeah. at, at one point. And yeah, I mean, I think a writing practice and I, th that's another reason that I used the word practice very deliberately um, is to connect it up with things like meditation mm -hmm. about, you know, sitting with your thoughts and sifting through them and, you know, recognizing like which ones are the ones that are just sort of like passing through you and which are the ones that actually speak to something that you care about. Um, you know, something that you actually want to not keep inside, but to, uh, to put out there and uh and elaborate on and you know there are there are parts of the book where you know for example thomas merton is a big part of like the first or the second chapter uh you know that idea that you know contemplative practice for him was about um becoming who you are and to me that is an end goal of writing not just having like you know the words on the page um but becoming the person capable of putting those those words on that page. Hey, can you talk a little about the the sense of spirituality and and I don't want to say religiosity. Yeah, you, I mean that, you, that's you a, about that's it. a tricky thing, <laughs> yeah. um, particularly when. And I was sort of like re recognizing this um, recently. I I had forgotten that the origins of the newsletter in the spring of 2018 um, really sort of stemmed from this moment early that year where I don't want to say for lack of a better metaphor, because I have plenty of metaphors for this, but one of the metaphors that I have for this is that like God sort of like tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, you got, yeah. You know, here's something to do with your life. And he didn't, you know, it would be great if he had, if God had said to me, you know, you need to start a newsletter to tell people about writing. <laughs> he, he didn't say that. And not tiny letter. I'm <laughs> saying Substack. That's what you got to go. I'm yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you felt a calling, but I felt, felt a call. I felt some sort of calling. It wasn't a, it wasn't a voice precisely. And I, I wrote about this, not for the newsletter, but, um, someplace else about how it's like your 8,000 your 8, page manifesto like Philip K. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> See, this is why I don't talk about I know, this. I know, right? It's just us, no, but, but you felt, yeah. Uh, and I, yeah, you felt the need to change. I turned, something. The, I turned the page in a book and there was like, boom, something right there in front of me that was like, yeah. Yeah. And so basically I spent Lent 2018 figuring out what the hell had happened. Uh, and what I was supposed to do with that. Mm. And that consisted of like 20 minutes of written meditation uh, a day in, in, in a notebook, and which, which is essentially just sort of like, you know, you sit there and whatever comes into your head, you write it down and you follow the lead. So automatic writing? Not is it really automatic. Okay, I, I, I don't know. So not automatic me. writing in that sort of like spiritualist sense yeah. where, you know, not like channeling, it, not channeling at all. Okay. It, it is very much like paying attention to your thoughts, not trying to like, you know, connect with some extra dimensional or, or, or yeah. whatever, um, but sorting through your thoughts and putting them down on paper because... Um, you know, in that classic sort of like David Allen getting things done sense, you know, once it's on paper, you can stop preoccupying yourself with it and, and come back to it when you need it. Yeah. Um, but anyway, over the course of Lent, uh, it sort of dawned on me that, you know, I did have something to share about writing, about uh, being a writer. And that's how the newsletter sort of fell into place. To circle back to the original part of the question about spirituality versus religiosity, 
Um, yeah, I have mentioned it a couple of points in the newsletter because it's a newsletter and now a book that mentions things like Thomas Merton, um, Henry Nouwen, um, Buddhist meditation. You know, there's a medieval saint in there at one point. Um, you know, we've already talked about Jesus and the mustard seed. To say that, you know, I draw upon these metaphors, but the purpose of this book is not to evangelize for a spirituality. Um, you know, you subscribed to this newsletter or you bought this book because you wanted to learn how to be a writer or you know, how to yeah. develop a consistent writing practice. You know, you didn't come necessarily to hear what I think about God or, or, or religion. And frankly, I'm still in the process of figuring that out even to this day. So it's not like I can come forward with like, you know, any sort of like the firm truth. prophetic message. Yeah. Um, but they are the metaphors that guide my thinking of how a writing practice works. Um, I hope that to a certain extent, the metaphors that I draw upon are somewhat syncretic, um, that I'm not over relying on one tradition or another, um, but that I'm learning things from a lot of different disciplines. Yeah. And it's not just religious in the book. I mean, you have, we'll say secular, you know, material uh, yeah. uh, examples too. For example, I know that you, um, one of the sections that spoke to you pretty intently was the section on running. That having taken over my life for the last, it'll be three years next month. Oof, sorry. Yeah, uh, just thinking of my knees and all the, the abuse they've taken from running now. But, but yeah, the the way you bring running in, or the running memoirs you brought in as... as yeah, that running memoirs. serves as a pretty effective metaphor for writing practice as well. That, um, yeah, we talked about before, the conscious choice of I am going to write or I am going to sit on the couch and watch this thing. You know, I am going to go out and and do my mile. Or I am going to sit on the couch and watch this yeah. thing. Um, and certainly, you know, the goal of running is. There's a lot of different ways it can be read. Yes. <laughs> you're running to, you're running from. from. Yeah, there, there's a lot of, you know. Yeah. Um, very few people are running with the goal of, you know, this is my, you know, this is my career. This is my lifeblood. Um, I am going to be the fastest. I mean, there are people for whom that is a realistic goal and there are people for whom it is not. Um, but I think a lot of us run simply because we, you know, we want to be healthier. However we define that, you know, we want to hit some goal. However, you know, we define that goal. Um, but that it's, an overall process of transformation uh, in the same way that writing for me is a, a process of transformation of, of honing yourself, of making conscious choices towards becoming a particular type of person. Mm -hmm. And who do you see yourself becoming? Oh, I don't know. Complicated, loaded question. Yeah, it is a complicated, <laughs> loaded question. Um, I mean, I feel personally that, you know, the last three years I've gotten better at becoming a more empathetic person. Um, you know, one of the things that writing about other people forces you to do is that it forces you to really like pay attention to other people, hmm. um, to try and see things from their perspective. Um, so I hope I've gotten better at that. Um, for me, and this comes through a little bit in the book, um, it has really been an opportunity to examine various forms of privilege and it made me realize in some ways that, you know, this sort of dream of becoming a writer or being a full-time writer, 
that many of us have. There's a certain kind of like privileged bourgeois aspect to that. Yeah, there are there are socioeconomic groups that that thought would never even occur to them mm-hmm. that you know I'm going to be a writer as opposed to the imminent day to day life yeah. or, has to get through. Or it would occur to them, um, but the system is stacked up against them in so many ways yeah. that it it never becomes a realistic goal. Um, that doesn't mean it's an impossible goal. I mean, we see people all the time who push against those boundaries uh, and push against those um, barriers. But it is much easier for certain groups of you know people. You know, if you tell people, it's like, oh yeah, find find an hour or so out of your day to like sit and write. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, go out, buy some, you know, buy these, you know, just this, in fact, just the simple part of like, you know, going out and buying creative writing handbooks. Yeah. It requires a certain amount of economic privilege. Um, so it's, you know, it's made me aware of that. Um, it's made me, certainly made me aware of masculine privilege. Um, in the literary world and the ways in which the literary world mirrors the world at large. And, you know, it's taught me to interrogate and deconstruct those things in ways that I hope are not just personally useful, but, you know, when applied outward, can work uh, towards establishing a more equitable system. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's audacious. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I by no means claim that this particular book is going to bring about the kingdom of God on earth <laughs> <laughs> or, or a socialist utopia. Yeah. Uh, and maybe they're the same thing. <laughs> I, I, I've got a book over there, This Life, by Martin Hagland, a professor at Yale, that basically theorizes that, you know, yeah. that, that the, uh, except in his world, um, one has to you know, be radically atheistic to really bring about paradise on earth. And I'm like, wow, it's an interesting perspective. Let's sit down and, and, you know, talk through that. The great thing was he was so uh, anxiety ridden by the time we finished. He called a day later and asked, please don't air the episode. I, I, I just feel too worked up and too nervous about everything I said. I gave him three days and sent him the raw files and he came back. All my friends said I'm overreacting. It's OK, Gil. Mm-hmm. We only have this one life on Earth, but, you know, I'm OK with this podcast going up. So, mm-hmm. you know, so it all worked out. Yeah. But, but yeah. Well, you know, it's a scary thing to put your truth forward yeah. uh, for the first time. Even when you're that far along in the process and that, and that the book is out and you're going out and talking to it, um, or and about you're, it yeah. you're, you're going out and talking to people about it. Uh, you know, it's especially when, you know, you, you've really tapped into your message uh, that you're not just, you know, going through the motions, um, you know, to say like, yeah, this is where I'm coming from. And yeah. You know, there, there is that anxiety about like, oh my God, how are people going to see this? Uh, and I think at a certain point, you know, one of the key realizations for me was that it's like, yeah, there's like, you know, seven, eight billion people in the world. Some of them are just not going to get it. Yeah. Uh, and you kind of have to like, you know, keep it going for the people who will. Did people write to you about the email? Not a lot. Um, you know, I get encouraging messages on uh, on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, every once in a while, an encouraging email. Um, and I think, I think just encouraging messages in general. I mean, I have had people tell me that, like, specific um, issues of the newsletter were like, oh, I, you know, that, that was a great message for me to hear right now. Um, I'm hoping that as the book is out in the world... Um, you know, we're talking like two weeks into the book's release. And I've always kind of seen this as not like, you know, a book of like the season. 
although I, I hope it has a great debut season, but as something that hopefully will be around for a long time for people to pick up on. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I would love to have word get back to me about that. But I also kind of feel like, you know, that's another outcome that I have to let go. Right. And within the book, you, drawing on your own experience, are cognizant of, you know, the publicity thing. And you're working with a publisher you actually like uh, in, in this case. But, you know, there's always the weird circumstances of when a book comes out and, and, and all that. And just not being able to control, especially in this book buying or book selling environment that we live in. Um, but yeah, it's, it's one of those things. It's always, to me, always gratifying with the, the email I send out with the podcast when I get a couple of people writing or just, you know, dropping a line or two back to me about stuff. It's, it's, um, rewarding without having to worry about a reward, I guess. Yeah. And there's a lot of talk There's a consistent sort of like strain of attitude that you hear among writers that, oh, why do I have to do all this marketing stuff? I wrote the book already. You know, yeah. Why do I have to keep selling it? And it's like, you know, did you really think the end of it was that you would like, you know, write the book and and then it would you know, just drop it out there and you could walk away from it? Um, I mean, you wrote this book to share a message with people. You you have to keep going out there and trying to share the message. Um, you know, that doesn't mean that it's going to work in a certain way. Um, you know, there are a million ways that a book launch can go wrong. You know, we happened to talk on the drive here about Jack Welsh launching a business book on 9-11, which, you know, sank without a trace. And that was supposed to be the, the biggest thing in the world once upon a time. So it can happen to anybody. Yeah. I mean, there were plenty of books that came out on 9-11, you know, novels um, that were really interesting novels. Uh, and I think that people had a lot of hopes and aspirations not just the writers themselves, but the publishers, you know, had these aspirations for them. And, yeah, you know, I just hate the fact that we're dating ourselves by citing 9-11, given that, you know, some people who are going to be reading your book were probably single digit age when, when that happened. <laughs> are going to be, you know, yeah, I heard about that, but I don't know what it really, you know. But, you know, I mean, think of all the people who had books coming out in early January of this year. Yeah. A number of whom I recorded podcasts with who were very unhappy about the yeah. lack of book tours, book festivals, yeah. you know, et cetera. But, yeah, yeah. what did you, uh, in keeping with that or dovetailing with the question of, of the self you're becoming, specifically the, the pandemic era, did it teach you, you know, not, hey, what did you like about coronavirus? But, you know, what 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 did you find essential, I guess, or inessential in your life? What changed for you? this past year plus. So one of the things that defined my pandemic experience was that before it all started, I had been a freelancer for a number of years, but was actively looking for a staff position. Um, for the security of a staff position. And had actually begun talking to a company just before sheltering in place began. In fact, I was supposed to go down to Philadelphia in early March to interview with this company. And they had called me a day before the interview and said, you know, maybe we should do this over Zoom. And I was like, by then it was sort of like, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah starting I mean, to I'm I you yeah, know, I was still comfortable enough that I was willing to take the trip but also happy to have the out. Um so we did the interview over Zoom. And then kind of like all went to our apartments for a while. And then they came back to me at the end of March and said, would you be willing to uh, to work remote? And it was always going to be a remote job because I live in New York City. The job is in Philadelphia. 
uh, with a Quaker media company. And so when they offered me part-time work at first, escalating to full-time work in the summer, yeah, I was really happy to have that opportunity. Uh, it provided my days of sheltering in place with a structure. And a structure that, you know, as I said before, in the best kinds of jobs that I've had, spoke to my inner life in a meaningful way. You know, I was basically helping um, the folks at Friends Journal get the message out about their articles, uh, about their features in the magazine and on the website. Um, you know, using my experience with social media and newsletters to to try to get people to to read these you know, these testimonies of, about Quaker experience. Uh, and it's funny because I almost didn't apply for that job. Mm -hmm. um, I had seen the job listing. It was in Philadelphia. And so I, my original response to it was to just tweet it out and say, you know, if you live in Philadelphia and are interested in the Quakers, this looks like a really great opportunity sure. to help spread the good news of the gospel. And then, you know, like an hour later, I was still thinking about it. And I DM'd them and said, you know, does this job have to be in Philadelphia? And they had said, you know, we had thought about that, um, but send us your resume. And I did, and that's how the whole thing snowballed. So, you know, going back to that idea of a calling again, but again, one that put me a little bit further along on a path of, you know, self-interrogation, of a particular kind of self-interrogation that has implications for cultural and social justice mm -hmm. um, because, you know, those are the things the Quakers care about. Sure. Um, you know, and so, you know, my summer of 2020 was to a certain extent, you know, immersed in Quaker messaging and pulling together this book from the things that I had been doing before. Um, and I was plenty immersed in the Quakers before, um, you know, which is why I wanted to work with a Quaker publication. Um, but, you know, when that becomes your day job, it really sort of like intensifies the experience. And in that respect, having... Again, we'll say privilege or, or, or you know, having the, that, well, that privilege of a, a, a regular job, something that was keeping you structured and keeping you whole, um, gets you through the past year or, you know, were there degrees that you were still uh, like all of us, you know, what the hell is my life at this point or what the hell is this world turning into? Uh, there was... So I mean, we're also headed towards the election at that point. Yeah. And I know that was, so, and that's part of the book also, um, you know. So, yeah. Um, I mean, at the same time that it's like, you know, that structure that was developing was a bulwark against a growing pandemic uh, that was growing in particular because the despotic regime that had managed to seize power in America was, as far as I can tell, willfully incompetent in its handling of the pandemic. I've got stories I'll tell you off mic, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, just like if I really wanted to, I could go into my whole, you know, not entirely frivolous theory that Donald Trump is the Antichrist. <laughs> but, 
Yeah. So even from within my position of privilege, I am looking at a world that is in the throes of a pandemic, in the throes of a global totalitarianist movement, in a climate emergency. Hmm. Uh, you know, in some of the largest economic disparity that has ever been seen um, and where marginalized people of all sorts faced greater existential threats and increasing existential threats. So, yeah, the, and there are parts in the final chapter. The final chapter is the one that was, I think, most written on the fly rather than... It, it feels as though it's of a moment. Yeah. Uh, in a moment, I, I should say. Yeah. yeah. That, um, you know, so much of the book was pulled together from 2019 and 2018 columns. Um, but for the landing, as it were, I kind of, you know, and knowing that I was writing towards the election, um, you know, like in the first draft, you know, it was more sort of like, and who knows what will happen in the election. And then, of course, by the and then it became, oh, well, you know, Trump was defeated in the election, but that doesn't mean we're out of the woods yet. And then in January, it was like, oh, yeah, we'd better revise the ending again to, to account for the uprising. Um, that, yeah, there is so much work to be done. Um, and one of the things that the last chapter talks about in particular um, was about how much work has to be done in examining our privilege and recognizing um, recognizing the ways in which people are marginalized out of that privilege and the need to bring everybody into the fold. Hmm. Not to do it in that sort of like, oh, I read White Fragility and I'm, I'm, I'm good now. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's not enough. Um, and it's also... Or, you know, sandwich joints using Juneteenth as their discount code today, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's um, somebody I quote in that chapter, uh, a novelist... Kelsey McKinney, hmm. where she basically says something, and I'm going to mangle the exact words, but, you know, you don't read Toni Morrison, you know, to stay up to date with black literature. You know, you read Toni Morrison because she's one of the greatest novelists America has ever produced and because the books are damn good. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's not a bingo sheet where you're like, yeah, or, or a scavenger hunt. Yeah. Um, you know, you read great books um, because they speak to human experience. And the more that you realize that human experience is a very broad category, that it isn't like, you know, oh, here is the, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant experience and a bunch of others. Yeah. <laughs> but that they are all the human experience on equal footing. At that point, your literary experience changes. And hopefully, beyond that, um, to the extent that literature affects the way you see the world, the way you see the world changes. How much do you have to consciously do that? I, I think in terms of using my my podcast guest demographics as a surrogate endpoint for how shitty a human being I am because it's usually white men and I have to go out of my way I'm like I I'm I've recorded with 12 men in a row I really have to you know branch out get more diverse and push this and when I do that they're incredibly rewarding conversations it's not like you know, eating your vegetables, you know, these, these things turn out to be, you know, fantastic episodes with people who just 
don't get pitched to me normally or, you know, if I pitch three people and one of them gets back to me, it turns out to be the guy and not a woman or a person of color. You know, so how much, you know, I think do you have to be conscious of, of your your intake, I guess. Very conscious. Yeah. Uh, and. And we are. White men of pretty much exactly the same age, 50. Yeah, or, I'm I just turned 51, but. Yeah, okay. We're in it within a year. Yeah. We're 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 of the same cohort. And I think for us and for the rest of our cohort, there is a great deal of course correction that needs to be done. Hmm. Stemming back through a half century of cultural influence. Yeah, you know, I th I thought about this a lot in the book, um, you know, particularly in chapters where I was looking at lifelong influences, mm -hmm. such as, uh, you know, the memoirist Jim Bowden, uh, who wrote yeah. Ball Four. <laughs> I was wondering if you ever got to meet him. Was, was I, I actually question. did meet okay, him. Well, okay. We'll I, I met him <laughs> once. Okay. Um, and, you know, it, it actually turned into like a, a one of the... You know, they always say, don't meet your heroes, but that one actually went well. Yeah, good. <laughs> but circling back. Okay, so we're 50 years old. We're white males. We're science fiction fans. So I'm going to assume that we grew up reading pretty much the roughly the same canon, give or take a few names. Yeah. Asimov, Heinlein, Clark. Right. Herbert. Uh, I never I never did the Dune thing. Somehow I, I stayed out of out of that portion of the canon. But yeah. Yeah. But generally, yeah, we overlap a whole yeah. bunch. And then even escalating to like the, the quote unquote next generation after or the the next wave after the golden age. You know, it's Ellison. Yeah. Silverberg. Niven and Pornell. Yeah. And Samuel Delaney, who I ended up publishing. And, but, yeah. yeah. And see, but Samuel Delaney is the one. Yeah. <laughs> That's that's oh well he's yeah yeah just like you know Ursula K Le Guin was the one woman, um, and those you know that was that was our cultural that was our indoctrination into science fiction yeah um, mystery writing it was much the same way, um, you know who did yeah you know, who were the mystery writers we read growing up Chandler. McDonald, Robert B. Robert B. Parker, um, McBain, yeah. Um, you know, and Donald Westlake. But yeah, he's, Donald he's, Westlake. Yeah. Uh, you know, it wasn't until maybe around 1990, I want to say. Um, maybe it was the 80s, but it wasn't until, an, a, certainly not until I was an adult, that Walter Mosley really came on the scene. Yeah, and. There may have been predecessors, but they certainly weren't placed in front of us. Yeah. And we were a non-internet generation at that yeah. point, so we had to find the—we had to go to bookstores. Yeah. And we had to find someone yeah. who would tell us, you know, oh, you need to be reading this guy. You mm -hmm. know, that's—, that's yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we're just going through the pop culture stuff. You know, once you get into, like, the literary canon, the, the quote-unquote Western canon— you know, that debate's been going on since the 90s as well. Um, so you still have to, uh, you know, work through those initial premises of, you know, what is out there. And it's something that the industry is dealing with now as well, the, the book publishing industry. I think book publishing has gotten more diverse in the last decade or so. But it's still a case where, you know, many of the gatekeepers them are themselves of a certain cohort yeah. and not seeing the opportunities to bring more people into the fold. Um, so I definitely feel like moving forward because I did sort of realize as I was pulling together sections of this book 
you know, still how much, because it was drawing on 50 years of white masculinity, how much that's reflected in the cultural markers that I put forward, for example. And so part of subsequent books and subsequent newsletters, I hope, is to continue expanding my own horizons and learning from other voices and other traditions and sharing that with people. You have an idea for a next book? Pretty much like, you know, more of the same. <laughs> I think. Um, but there are, uh, there are, you know, other directions that that can, can go on. Um, you know, it's not going to be like, you know, regurgitating the same specific advice over and over again. But I think there's a lot more to be said about um, about the process of becoming, of about um, the process of finding yourself. Um, and about, um, you know, I'm... I'm thinking one of the things that I'm working on now is that sort of like dealing with issues of toxic masculinity um, through, in particular, through stoicism. Yeah, you know, stoicism has for the last 20 years or so been sort of like pitched to us as this self-improvement regimen um it's kind of like you know shut off your emotions focus on you know focus on the practical and yeah. get get things done don't get caught up in the, you know i mean yeah. lord knows it's like in the book i write myself about like you know don't get caught up in fantasizing about the outcomes do the work yeah and that is certainly you know influenced by you know, having read Marcus Aurelius at an impressionable age. <laughs> um, but, you know, there are other aspects of of broader stoicism and of, like, that idea of, like, you know, suppressing the emotional that are used and deployed in very patriarchal ways. So it to perverse ends. Yeah, to yeah. perverse ends. And sort of learning to recognize that um, within oneself and, and then to avoid falling into that trap in the future. Hmm. Um, so that's a, a future essay uh, once I get all the reading done. But I did have a, a question related to when we were talking about, you know, marketing and and the idea of publicity, I guess of the broader question, the Internet era that I'm, I'm curious as to your your take on who our online selves are exactly. I mean, it's something you go into a little in the book in terms of the need to put oneself out. But how much, you know. How real uh, do you do you see yourself online, and how much do you do you you know read someone and think that person's interesting, or that person's online persona is interesting? Yeah, that's a really interesting philosophical question, and it's one that I've kind of been interested in since the boom of the internet in the '90s, yeah. um, when I first read Sherry Turkle for the first time. Hmm. Um, Sherry Turkle is. Uh, psychologist at uh i think she's an mit i know she's been published by mit in the past um but she has been very concerned with the ways in which people present themselves online and i think there was um you know she was more responsible about this than other people i think in the 90s but there was this wave in the mid late 90s of panic over people pretending to be other than who they were on yeah. the internet. Um, 
whereas she writes in a more sophisticated way about the fact that the internet gave people an opportunity to try out aspects of themselves that their immediate surroundings didn't necessarily provide them in, you know, I think much the same way that for people who, you know, in the pre-internet age and, you know, and, and today too, but let's say that you have the opportunity and privilege to go to college hundreds of miles from your hometown in a, you know, at a school where nobody knows you. I think many of us, certainly I took that opportunity to attempt, however falteringly. Yeah. <laughs> we all think we're going to reinvent ourselves. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and some people are more successful at that than others. Uh, and with the Internet back then, it was much the same way that you could go online, um, you know, whether you were hanging out in Usenet news groups um, or in MUDs or MOOs, um, and interact with people in ways that, you know, bringing out aspects of your personality that for whatever reason, you know, you didn't feel comfortable with in real in, life. In real life. Um, for some people, it was about exploring their sexuality or their gender identity. For some people, it was simply about becoming more assertive. Uh, or, you know, being able to like finally talk about something that they were passionate about that nobody else around them gave a shit about. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think for a lot of people, that was a very rewarding experience and still is to this day where, you know, you can go online and connect with people from around the world. Um, I know from my experience that it was a very empowering experience and in some ways too empowering um, because it, um, you know, I was sort of like joke to people um, about what an asshole I was in the nineties um, mm -hmm. because of the internet. And, you know, I joke, but I don't. <laughs> um, Mes but, message boards were yes. essentially the, the, you know, Hellscape. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it, it was the uh, proto version of what Twitter turned into in some respects. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah. And there was there. Are, you know, you know. I've made some progress over the last twenty years. Some people would likely say not enough. <laughs> but yeah, so coming around to the original part of the question in terms of seeing our online presentations as idealized or aspirational selves or getting to a point where we can integrate them uh, with our offline identities more and more. I mean, I feel like my online and offline presentations are fairly well integrated at this point. Yeah, you know, having been online since 1992, 93. Um, but I mean, absolutely, you know, there are aspects of my personality that come out more forcefully on Twitter than they would in a normal conversation or a, an audible conversation yeah. in face to face. Uh, yeah. But there, I just did it again and said normal rather than, you know, right. I mean, <laughs> virtual and virtual. Or, you know, yeah. tw Twitter is normal these days. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, yeah, I still, yeah, I can still be fairly caustic on Twitter. Um, I am so much better at that than I was even just like, you know, three years ago, you know, certainly, you know, the calling and the Quakers have had a lot to do with that. Um, but I do still catch myself. Um, you know, I will type out a, a 
a withering response to, you know, some right wing person online. And I will like, you know, look at it and be like, yeah, I, I really don't want to step in that today. Yeah. And like, let it go. Um, and I'm at the point now where I can do that, like, you know, 99 times out of 100. But there's still that, you know, that one slips through every now and then. But as long as you don't go viral for, yeah. you know, the wrong reason, I yeah. guess it's good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that was the, the well, part of the problem in the 90s was that, um, you yeah, know, we didn't call it going viral then. But, uh, you know, if you gained public accolade for being, you know, brutally withering in your response to what was widely perceived as idiocy, you know, it, it created a feedback loop. Yeah. Um, you know, you were in, you know, oh, people like it when I like, you know, you know, rail into somebody, rail into, somebody, <laughs> rail into this right wing nut. Let's do it some more. Um, yeah. Uh, so it yeah. was not necessarily a good thing to encourage. And <laughs> that characterizes certain aspects of, of the web today, or at least our the outrage machine that's engineered mm -hmm. to keep us, you know, constantly clicking and, and you know, typing angrily. Mm -hmm. but. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's unrealistic to tell people to just stay offline. Um, I'm, and certainly I don't. Um, but again, it's like, you know, be conscious of what you're doing while you're doing it. Which ties us back into the book itself, yeah. which is a nice way to close out, except that I do want to ask my one great question. What you've been reading? What have I been reading? Um, did you bring something with you on the train ride out here? I actually did pick up. Um, so years ago, I was at the Housing Works bookstore in Lower Manhattan, a uh, used bookstore. Um, it's a wonder, it, it was a wonderful space. I haven't been in many, many years. I don't even know if they've opened back up yet because they had closed for the pandemic. Uh, uh, Housing Works like thrift store on the Upper West Side reopened a couple of weeks ago. My one trip into the city, they happened to mention that it was open, but I have no idea about the bookstore. But okay. I love that space. Yeah. It's great. Uh, and one of the great things about that space is that it was a used bookstore where all the proceeds went to help um, houseless people in New York City with AIDS. Hmm. Anyway, I'm in there, let's say about like 2004, 2005. And somebody had just donated a pretty solid run of Ross Thomas paperbacks hmm. at $2 a pop. So I got like, you know, 10 of them. And then they sat on my bookcase for 15 years. Hmm. Yeah. After, uh, after launching into war and peace at the beginning of the pandemic, Wrong. Uh, which, which a lot of people, uh, did. I actually liked it. It turned out that I liked it. Um, uh, for but, me though, there was just the, I, I couldn't focus on a book for the first month or so. Like I couldn't get through anything. And then I, I picked up uh, Matt Ruff's 88 names and it's like this propulsive 250 pages. I just blew through it in like a day and a half. And Oh, that's what reading is. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm used to this now. I can get back into to the longer stuff that I was on. But but anyway, you, you yeah. made it through War and Peace. <laughs> but uh, yeah, War and Peace, twelve pages a day. Um, a public space was doing an online book club at, on Instagram. It mm -hmm. went great. Um, anyway, after that, uh, I was like, you know, I've sat with these. You know, these Ross Thomas books have been staring at me. You know, <laughs> prominently placed on the mass market paperback shelf in my bookcase. Let's let's dive into them and. They turned out to be like, you know, he, he's such an incredible plotter yeah. um, and and character writer. You know, the, he, he's the kind of guy who can drop like new characters in like five chapters from the end. And you're still like, you know, find them just as fascinating yeah. as the people that, you know, you've been following along for the last 150 pages. Um, so I've been every once in a while, I've been picking up one of those. Um I also started, um, I want to say Olivia Lang. I can never remember how to pronounce. Yeah. L-A-I-N-G. Yeah, yeah. No idea. Um, that new book, um, is it everybody or everyone? Um, but whatever it is, it's, it's about Wilhelm Reich. And 
but from a very personal perspective. I mean, it's not a biography. Um, it's more like one of those books where one person sort of like guides you through their own thought processes. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's been really fascinating. Um, I'm still like in the early chapters of that. Uh, but I'm really hoping, uh, to get back to that soon. Again, if you brought it with you, you could read it on the train back to New York. This is true. But I, that I did not bring with me. That's on my iPad. Uh -huh. Um, yeah. yeah. Do you do more e-reading or, or print reading? I think about half and half. Yeah. Um, I've you know been picking up a lot more print books in the last year or so. Um, I have some you could take with you, by the way, on the, the way out. There's about six stacks over here. I had to move them out of another storage place very recently. So. <laughs> Oh, my wife would kill me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, trust me. There are more review copies that showed up in the last couple of days. And mm -hmm. I thought, yeah, Ron's the exact guy who would be getting the same things, you know, and they're just. I actually have been getting my review copies digitally. I've done that later. for a bunch. And we did that for your book. But, yeah. uh, you know, some, some people are getting back to just sending print without bothering to ask me. And mm -hmm. it's just piling up, especially books that I'm not going to get around to interviewing the author or somebody that they know they can't get for me for mm -hmm. the podcast, but whatever. Yeah. Everybody's got a quota to hit, I guess. <laughs> but uh, the main thing is, is that, yeah, I'm, I am still reading. Um, I recently reread uh, Robert Anton Wilson's Cosmic Trigger, yeah. uh, which was, uh, which was very, I mean, I've read that like five or six times um, since I was 16. Um, so and you're always finding new stuff in it. Yeah. Did you, gosh, I forget where it is. Oh, High Weirdness by Eric Davis. I loved High Weirdness. I haven't read it yet. I've got it over there and we were talking about recording, uh, in the before time. And now it's like, oh yeah, I should sit down and read that. Cause now I can do remotes and not have to, you know, plus we could probably do it telepathically instead of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it, that, that's a really interesting book. Um, I mean, like I say, I read Robert Anton Wilson for the first time when I was 16 or so. Uh, and I had already read Philip K. Dick by that point. Um, and those are two of the three authors that Eric Davis talks about a lot in High Weirdness. I never got into Terrence McKenna. Uh, I thought at the time, I thought that was a little too out there and uh, new age freaky for me. Um in the same way that I've never really gotten into Whitley Stryber. And maybe that's a mistake on my, on my part. Maybe that's something that I should circle back to at some point. Um, but one of the things about Robert Anton Wilson that has been really helpful for me when I remember it, and, and certainly the, this has become clearer on the rereads, as an adult um, rather than um, when I was a teenager is that notion of being able to interrogate an experience from a lot of different perspectives. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you who aren't familiar and which is probably a lot of people because cosmic trigger is not, really ever become more than an underground hit. Um, so Cosmic Trigger is Wilson's memoir, basically about, um, you know, it starts with him as a freelance writer and then an editor for Playboy. Um, he meets Timothy Leary at the beginning of his career and sort of like follows him through the whole arc. Um, but then Wilson himself, um, as he is experimenting with um, cannabis and peyote and other substances and then begins experimenting with ceremonial magic, uh, particularly the Aleister Crowley and, um, breed of magic starts having these experiences. And he is very particular in his describing of them to say that it's like, well, yes, it, you know, it feels like I may be being contacted by entities from Sirius, the dog star, but there are other explanations. <laughs> there are, you know, there are rational explanations for this. And so he's able to look at that um, 
with that kind of like, you know, negative capability, um, that yeah. bifurcated perspective to be able to say like, you know, there are rational explanations, there are materialist explanations, and there is a mystical explanation, you know, what makes sense to you? Um, yeah. And so when I had my own experience three years ago, um, you know, there are ways in which I can absolutely see it as like, you know, pure random coincidence. Um, but, you know, it's interesting to see it as a message from God. Yeah. Uh, it has certainly made my life interesting to treat it as a message from God and then to adjust my future behavior accordingly. <laughs> um but also to be aware that, you know, maybe it isn't. And, you know, but it, it's a different Tolstoy. Yeah. It's, it's the end of Anna Karenina instead of war and peace where Levin has his moment and realizes minutes later that the imminent world is still going to, to mess with him and he's still going to get pissed off about X, Y, and Z and, and all these things that he thought for five minutes he had trans. I'm doing the big sweeping arm gestures right now. He thought he had transcended. And then in the the close of the book realizes the transcendence is daily. Yeah. You know, you have to make this, you can accept that, you know, this, this may have been a visitation, but you have to do the work, yeah. which you, gets us yeah. back to writing practice and everything else. We actually exactly. close the loop. Yeah. This is you awesome. Know, you, you, you hit that Satori experience. And then, you know, after that, it's right back to chop wood, carry water. You know, you, you have that moment of insight in your writing and, you know, the next day you go back and see what the world is, you know, is telling you now. I will get back to writing at some point. You'll see. And I'll send you another zine. But Ron, thanks so much for coming back on the show. Thank you for coming out to New Jersey. Thank you for being the, the first person to enter my house who wasn't repairing or installing something. Although, if you can help me with the fridge, I would really... I'm just kidding. <laughs> <I don't. laughs> thanks. This has been great. And that was Ron Hogan. Go read his new book, Our Endless and Proper Work, from Belt Publishing, and maybe subscribe to Ron's email, Destroy Your Safe and Happy Lives, which is at ronhogan.substack.com. Ron's on Twitter, where he tries to be less caustic, as he said, as Ron Hogan, all one word, which is R-O-N-H-O-G-A-N. You can visit Beatrice.com, B-E-A-T-R-I-C-E.com, to learn more about Ron's work. And, well, if you get something out of our Endless and Proper work or the email, drop Ron a line. That's, that's something that we get into or got into in the conversation about the the importance of just reaching out and, and providing a little uh, a little response or feedback to someone whose work you appreciate. Now, when it comes to supporting this podcast, well, I'd appreciate that sort of thing, too. Uh, first and foremost, though, tell other people about the show, uh, what you like about it. Um, you can drop me a line uh, by email, postcard, letter, or Google Voice message to tell me what you like and don't like about this podcast and who you'd like to hear me record with and what movie or TV show or book or comic or whatever or, you know, e-newsletter you think I should turn listeners on to. The Google Voice number is 973-869-9659. It does not go directly to my phone, so you don't have to worry about me picking up. You just leave a three-minute message there and I'll get it. Um, if you're okay with me including that message in a, an upcoming episode, let me know. I might reach out to you to find out if it's okay to include an excerpt. Um, but everything you leave will otherwise be assumed to be private because my life is a giant non-disclosure agreement anyway. Um, but if you have resources to spare, then I hope you will support individuals and institutions in need. My show has a Patreon and a, a PayPal and all that, but I'm doing just fine as far as money goes. Um, I really hope you will help people out through GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, um, or help institutions in need like your local food bank or the Poor People's Campaign, Freedom Funds, Voting Defense Funds, and things like that. Uh, Ron and I get into or got into um, the need to to help build a better world during this conversation, and um, I hope you'll take that to heart and help out. 
Last thing, I still have some copies left of the first issue of my very first zine, Haiku for Business Travelers. As Ron and I talk about, I do almost no writing anymore, except for the um, the daily journal that I keep, which I need to get to this morning. Um, I, I just took up art and painting, and I do that all the time, and I have no idea how to transfer that into a zine in a way that would be useful at all. But what I'm saying is the last published or the only published example of my writing that you might be interested in exists and it's free. So uh, if you want the first issue of Haiku for Business Travelers, which features my writing, photography, poems and a podcast excerpt, hit me up. Just drop me a line or visit Haiku for Business Travelers dot com. There's a form there that you can fill out. Um, you can kick in a few bucks for postage and production if you want, but uh, you're under no obligation. This is not about money making. It's just me sharing my art, such as it is. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at VMSPod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. Mm-hmm.